Our story for today comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17. On their return, the apostles told Jesus all they had done. Then, taking them along, he slipped quietly into a city called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out about it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed to be cured. The day was drawing to a close, and the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away, so that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a deserted place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fishes, unless we are about to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about fifty each. They did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were filled. And what was left over was gathered up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Starvation is a tool of empire. And it sure was a tool of the Roman Empire, which occupied first century Palestine. Bethsaida, where our miracle for today takes place, is a fishing community. Bethsaida means house of fishermen or house of hunters. This is a place where food is hunted, fished, collected, gathered. This is a site of the food industry. When the Roman Empire occupied their land, they implemented a system where a large portion of the fish and other harvests were collected by Rome, taken for the elite, stored away for days of war when famine might come, and they were, the food was redistributed unequally and sparingly to the people. So even though the people of Bethsaida were surrounded by plenty, they were being starved by empire. Starvation is a tool of empire. Amy Jill Levine highlights for us that this tool of empire being used in this way causes meals to become sites of danger. She tells the story of Herodias's daughter calling for the head of John the Baptist, and his head is served to her on a silver platter at a feast. While the people starve, Empire has even the heads of prophets served up on silver platters. Meals, Amy Jill Levine says, are sites of danger under empire. When Jesus gets to Bethsaida, the people form a crowd, signaling to us the people's desperation for hope, for the gospel, their desire for good news. Jesus taught them about the kingdom of God, which has values and foundations and cornerstones that are completely the opposite of empires. Jesus spent time with them, healing those who were in need of healing, and then wanted to see them on their way to find hospitality for the evening. He didn't want to leave the people out in the cold for his ego to be glorified. He would be glorified by their wellness, by their being taken care of. Again, opposite of empire. Before they go, though, Jesus instructs his disciples to feed them, to not let them go hungry. Looking in their packs, the disciples realize that they do not have enough to feed this entire crowd. Where Rome makes celebrations out of beheadings, Jesus organizes the people for full bellies. Where Rome takes food and demands glory, Jesus gives generously and trusts that it will be multiplied for the well-being of all. This story invites us to consider where the sites of danger are for us. Where is it that the forces of empire have a hold on us and are inflicting harm onto us or others? Or where is it that the forces of empire are inflicting harm onto others through us? This story invites us to consider that we might be the Roman soldiers enforcing the values and the policies of empire, and sometimes we might be the crowd, the hungry and the desperate. It invites us to strategize about how we might transform ourselves from being the soldiers or the crowd into being the disciples, 
The disciples model for us that we are to be people who transform sites of danger into sites of flourishing, sites of satisfaction. In order to do this, we must identify what makes something a site of danger in our world today, and then identify what we can do to transform or disrupt those systems and those policies and those cultural norms. It's become clear to me that the empire that we live under today, especially in the United States, is the empire of white supremacy, the empire of whiteness. White folks often lament that we don't have a culture of our own, but we sure do have one, and we enforce its norms every single day, even me. It's been helpful to me to name the characteristics of that culture so that I can more readily notice them being enforced and imposed upon me and when I am enforcing and imposing it upon others for its own sake, when I'm using these tools to reinforce the hierarchy of empire. The characteristics of the culture of white supremacy are these. Urgency, defensiveness, quantity over quality, worship of the written word, paternalism, either or thinking, power hoarding, fear of open conflict, individualism, progress meaning bigger and more, objectivity, and the right to comfort. So many of these things I value. I value urgency. I have little to no patience for people who have no sense of urgency. I have some fear of open conflict. I am often an individualist. I want to depend solely on myself and I expect that of others too. I fall into the trap that progress means bigger and more instead of becoming more and more who and what we're supposed to be. I hope I'm not alone in feeling a twinge of shame or embarrassment at the reading of this list, but shame is really not that useful for us. Naming and noticing the water we are swimming in is all we're doing here. We didn't create the culture of white supremacy, and we don't want to perpetuate it either. So what do we do? When I was in college, I was an intern at a church. My focus was youth ministry, but I was also part of a new worship service that was in a room other than the sanctuary. What this meant was that each and every week, we had to take down all of the tables in the room that were up for coffee hour and then put them back up after the service. I'm telling you, so much of church ministry is taking down and setting up tables. After a while, table logistics became second nature to me. I did it all the time. Every Easter, the youth group would host brunch after worship as a fundraiser. This also required the setting up and taking down of tables. And by Easter, well, I had setting up tables down pat. I was basically a professional table setter upper. And on this particular Easter, I was working alongside one of our youth to help set up a table. We had the big round table in front of us. We had just rolled it to where it was going to be set up and we were about to pull its legs out to set it up. But before we could even extend our hands towards the table legs, a grumpy old man came between us, pushed us aside and said, let me show you, let me show you how to do it. What was it about me that made him think I didn't know how to set up a table. Besides it being not that difficult of a task, especially for two people, this was so much of my job. I set up these tables every single Sunday and he had never been there to help. So what was it about me that made him think that I didn't know how to set up a table? It was clear to me in that moment that he didn't think I could set up a table because I was young and because I was female. This was a man's job, a man with experience in physical labor. I didn't name it this at the moment, but the culture that the grumpy old man was perpetuating was paternalism. Paternalism, according to Wikipedia, is action that limits a person's or a group's liberty or autonomy. 
and is intended to promote their own good. Paternalism implies that the behavior is against or regardless of the will of a person, or also that the behavior expresses an attitude of superiority. Why did the grumpy old man intervene in a situation that did not call for any intervention? Because he thought he could do it better than me. It promoted his own sense of self, his own sense of superiority over me and other people like me. In the moment, I was just offended by the assumption that I was incompetent at this task, especially after all the tables I'd set up. And as a spry college student whose face was suddenly red with anger, I couldn't leave it be. I turned to him and said, do you seriously not think I can set up this table? He mumbled something while continuing to wedge himself between us. And so I threw up my hands and I said, do it yourself then. It was a small thing to throw up my hands and let him know I was angry, but there was something in me that was not going to let him think that this behavior was okay, with me at least. I didn't ever wanna feel this way again. And I didn't want any of my youth to feel that way ever again. Looking back on it now, I hope that it was one small act of resistance against the paternalism inherent in the culture of white supremacy that we are all swimming in. Perhaps the sight of danger that is table set up at this particular church was transformed into at least a neutral site or a site for connection and teamwork and service because paternalism was disrupted that day. It was stopped in his tracks. As we continue our journey of discipleship, may we gain the vision that will help us identify the sites of danger, notice when the tools of empire are being used, and do something to resist their power. I hope that we will do something to create instead sites of flourishing and peace and wholeness and full bellies and cooperation and joy, sites of becoming and discomfort for the sake of growth and learning. I invite you, in response to the story of the feeding of the 5,000 and in response to my own story, to recollect your own stories where you did or did not disrupt the forces of empire, when you did or did not disrupt the culture of white supremacy, your stories might start like this. I did or did not disrupt the forces of empire when. I invite you then to share your stories about when you upheld or enforced or live into currently the characteristics of the culture of white supremacy, the culture of empire. Do you embrace and celebrate urgency like me, or is one of the other characteristics we named more important to you? Your stories might start like this. I enforced the culture of white supremacy when, or I enforced the culture of empire when. Please share with one another and receive one another's stories with grace and thanksgiving. Your stories are God's stories. Thanks be to God. Amen.